based on our prior experience. We generally don't want to do something that will make us look like a fool. There was something that popped up on my Facebook recently. Joe, I don't know if we've got the, we've got the photo on the downloads. Um, maybe try and find the photo on the downloads. So there was this pic that just popped up on Facebook and it grabbed my attention. It was a still photo of a man jumping off a jet ski in midair, having just launched himself off the edge of Niagara Falls. So here's the picture from October 1995. It's pretty much the grainiest picture you'll find on the internet. But I read the caption and learned that this guy called Robert Overacker from California had a rocket propelled parachute attached to his back that was to fire out his backpack and bring him gliding safely down to like a calmer part of the river below. You look at this picture and I don't know about you, but it has a great sense of foreboding about it. Like what is going to happen next? The guy put himself in a position where all of his trust, all of his trust, was in this rocket-propelled parachute. I'm guessing he, this was his first attempt. As I read on, I discovered that, sadly, Robert Uberacher didn't make it. The parachute failed, and shockingly, he fell to his death. I scroll down to the chat section below on Facebook, you know, where other Facebook users, they write their comments. And you can probably imagine in your head what people were writing. This is 30 years on from the time that this guy lost his life. And however sad that is, let's say that those comments in the Facebook weren't very complimentary about this man's wisdom. However sad it is that he died, we can't help but look at this picture and think, I don't want to be that guy. The type of guy that takes such a naive gamble that everyone mocks because it didn't work out. Let's consider another example of taking a gamble. Hey, John, you can take that one off. Thanks. You know the movies when you have a casino scene? There's tons of movies out there with casino scenes. There's almost too many movies with casino scenes. It's just a, it's a classic, you know, like in the westerns, you've got uh, the guys face off with the guns. The casino scene is a classic. They seem to crop up in James Bond films a lot. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. They always seem to crop up in James Bond films. Now, I'm not in any way condoning gambling. I know we're in a church. I know we're all of us believers in Christ. We need to know that gambling is not the law. We're not to condone gambling. But I'm just using this as an observation, as an analogy. We're all familiar with it in the movies. So, there's that familiar moment when everyone's around the casino table with all their chips stacked up in front of them. They get dealt their cards. It's always so tense and dramatic. This moment when the inevitable point comes and they always have this dramatic build-up of, I'm going to go all in and they throw their chips right into the middle of the gambling table. If it's in Casino Royale, then the keys of Aston Martin get thrown in as well. And if it's a Star Wars film solo, then Lando Calrissian hands over to Han Solo the keys of the Millennium Falcon. You know, then you put everything in that is valuable to you. Everything's on the line. When we come to the Lord and say, I'm all in, I give you everything, every part of my life, it can feel like a big gamble. When we lay everything down in our life for God, it can seem like a, a foolish decision. But that's only because we're seeing it from the point of view we have up to that moment. Our life experience has taught us to be concerned about going all in for God. The truth is, it's not a gamble at all. But it's no less dramatic 
than it is in the movies to God. It's a dramatic moment for the Lord. He wants us to get to this point with him. He wants us to be all in with him. We hold back our chips to ourselves. We want to retain control over our destiny, to increase our odds of success by holding on to what we already know based on our current perspective. But God's perspective is different. He knows that once you give it all up and give everything into his hands and go all in, he can then move in his power. For him to really move in his power, he needs each of us to deny ourselves, our perspectives, what holds us back, and just to trust in him. Then he moves in his power. When we step into the way of trust, of obedience, of surrender, and give it all up for him, he brings mega blessings to you and to your household. And you are then truly written into his story, into the plans and purposes of God's kingdom. This is beyond being saved as a believer. Jesus Christ has done everything on the cross, everything on the cross, for us to come into this wonderful, enriching life with God, where we are an active part of the kingdom of God in relationship deep relationship with the Father. You see, when you take your stand against the enemy and you're all in, he backs you up. When you think you're alone, but when you've gone all in, he places others in the faith alongside you. He gives you the desires of your heart you didn't even know you shared with him. He speaks to you and you hear his voice. He shares his perspective that you could not see before you surrendered. He equips you with everything you need and sends you out in his name. He gives you testimony upon testimony of how he has moved in your life in power when you go all in with him. It's a journey with God. It's sanctification. God's done all the hard work, but it's up to us once we've been saved to respond and to continue responding in surrender to God. You find he opens up a complex, a complex tapestry of circumstances because you just stepped into his possibilities. Our point of apparent weakness is actually our point of greatest strength. Going all in with God is one of the bravest and most pioneering things a man can do. Forget climbing Everest. Forget walking through fire. To surrender every part of your life to God, every part of your life, to put all your chips in the middle of the table for God, takes massive courage. It is a step that defines us as men of God. The Bible is full of good examples in the Old and New Testaments of of men going all in for God. Abraham did it. Moses did it. Elijah did it. Peter did it. Paul did it. Stephen did it to name a few. There's, there's tons of them in there. But I'd like us to take a look at the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. God's put it on my heart to share Nehemiah. So if you've got your Bibles with you, um, let's take a moment to, uh, to turn to Nehemiah. It's located after the Chronicles books, um, and it's actually in tandem with the book of Ezra, and it's just after Ezra. Nehemiah was not a traditional leader of God's people like many leaders in the Bible. He wasn't your regular biblical leader. And we'll also learn when we read the passage that even though Nehemiah heard from God, he also wasn't a traditional prophet in the sense of regular biblical prophets. The book of Nehemiah begins with him living in a foreign land, now in modern-day Iran, during the exile of God's people from Israel, the nation of his ancestors. See, he wasn't in the place where his fathers had lived. I'm going to be dipping in and out of the book of Nehemiah, but let's first take a look at the first couple of chapters. It's in a period of history about 430 years before Jesus was born. 
Nehemiah started off as a regular, regular guy, in fact, just like you and me to some degree. His job was a cupbearer to a foreign king called King Artaxerxes. This was a trusted and respected position because he ensured the king's cup was never poisoned and also meant he was regularly in close proximity to this great ruler. I know we don't rub shoulders with kings, but he started off in a different career to where God takes him to. He was within the inner circle of the king's palace staff, so he knew what it was to serve a king, and the king trusted him explicitly. And it's these qualities that I think ran in parallel with his relationship with God. He knew what it was to serve a king, and the king trusted him implicitly. So let's read chapter one. I'll read it for you. I'm from the NIV. I'm sorry. I forgot my ESV. So uh, just bear with me. Unless you've got something different. Have you got the NKJV? Okay. <laughs> Okay, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, which is in November, December, apparently, in the 20th year, which is in, which is about 430 years before Christ, while I was in the citadel of Susa, in modern-day Iran, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah and some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem been in the news a lot recently, the whole of Israel. Hanani and his brothers said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of Israel, of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and by your mighty hand. Some of this is, is, is possibly re- resonating with us um, as, as Israel is in our hearts and the whole of Israel and Gaza region. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant a, a success today By granting him favor in the presence of this man, I was cupbearer to the king. So, from this passage, we can make a few observations about Nehemiah. We learn here that Nehemiah saw himself as God's servant in verse 6. That he fasted, that he prayed, verse 4. That he understands the deep ways of God, in verse 5. That he practiced repentance, verse 6, and that he understood the importance of obedience and reverence towards God. He was in direct and intimate relationship with God. It was deeply personal. Being all in with God, he also had his eyes on the bigger picture. Because of his relationship God shared with Nehemiah his own heart for his people. And when the Lord shared his heart with Nehemiah, he wept. So he had the bigger picture. He recognized the trouble that Israel was in, their disgrace and their sins. He saw what needed changing. 
he interceded for God's people and openly confessed their collective sins, including his own. He didn't leave his own sins out. He, was, he had humility. He was able to have these attitudes and insight because he was in that relationship with God. Let's have a look at chapter 2. So, King Artaxerxes, I think is how you pronounce the king that he was serving as cupbearer, recognized Nehemiah is sad, which is apparently really out of character for Nehemiah. He's usually a pretty chipper guy. He's, you know, he's, he's pretty happy, easygoing. He obviously is in this close relationship with God, but King Artaxerxes recognized that his cupbearer, his trusted member of staff, who he relies upon to not get poisoned, is not looking too good. Um, so it says, um, it, I, was very, I was very much, afraid. he says, um, what does he say? Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. He had tact. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king clearly has sympathy with him and he asks, what do you want? What happens next in verse, verse 4 changes everything. Nehemiah responds to the request, what do you want? But because of Nehemiah's close relationship with God, I believe his response is actually a dual communication with the two kings in his life, in both the physical and the spiritual realms. I believe his reply to the king Artaxerxes was also a simultaneous prayer to his king in heaven where his real focus is. Why do I think this? Because it says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. He prays to God. He says he prays to God. And at the same time, he, asks, he tells um, King Artaxerxes um, and asks if he has favor in his sight to be able to go back to Jerusalem. We read in the following verses how his relationship with God allowed him to have boldness to get a leave of absence and to ask the king for letters to other powerful leaders, the enemies of God's people, so he can safely get back to Jerusalem. He also asked for additional building supplies to rebuild the city gates, to rebuild some of the city walls, and so they can have a house to live in. And the king grants him all of these things. And in verse 8, Nehemiah acknowledges God as the source of his blessings. He's very quick to point back to God and acknowledge God is actually in control, even though he's serving a very powerful man. None of this is lost on God. He says, and because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. The Lord then lays on an additional um, blessing because the king provides an escort and the king's own cavalry so he can actually get there safely. He's now on his mission with God. He sets out and immediately faces opposition. He's gone from the place where he is respected and he's sent out by God only because he's got this intimate all-in relationship with God. In verse 10, we get the first inkling of trouble from Israel's enemies. Enemies with their own agendas, getting very angry that the Israelites had the blessings of the king. But God anticipated this in advance and deals with the threats. God's already got this sorted because he's in this all-in relationship with the Father. By standing with God, Nehemiah came into alignment with the will of God. This is what happens when we go all in. God has so much more space to work with, and he moves in his power. He found himself positioned by God to receive his abundant blessings, his support and protection, because God was using him 
for his plans. He stepped into the plans of God. God wanted the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt, but no one else was stepping up. It took a man in another land who had, in previous ancestors, his previous generations, had connections with the land, but he had a heart for God, and God chose that man to go back. In chapter 2, verses six, uh, 11 to 16, we read how he arrives in Jerusalem. After a few days, he sneaks out on a secret mission to survey the walls, the fallen wheels, walls of the city, to work out, okay, how bad is this really? I've heard the reports. I want to know how bad it is for me personally. But it's a secret mission, and he does it at night with a few others. He says he only goes on one horse because he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. In verse 12, he says, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. It was a secret instruction from the Lord. This was his calling. He said, I had not told anyone what God had put on my heart. That is the calling that the Lord God gave him. Because he's in this intimate, close, personal, all-in relationship with God. He'd been given a mission to do, and he was obediently doing it. Then he shares his plans to rebuild the walls with the important men of Jerusalem. The priests, the officials, the nobles. He accompanied the plan. It wasn't just his own words. Because God had backed him up. He had already had powerful testimony that got their attention and were like, ah, this guy's surely with God. He's, he's got him. He's not just coming with a, some harebrained idea that we can do this. God had already backed him up because he was already with God. Now, for those of you who know the book of Nehemiah, you all know that the men of Jerusalem then each take responsibility for starting to rebuild sections of the wall and the towers all the way around the city of Jerusalem. If you scan chapter 3, it gives you details of every man and every section of the walls that were rebuilt. Under Nehemiah's leadership, these men led their families, the men in their families and their families, and took ownership of each section under their command. They all had to work together as a collective. We also read at the end of chapter 2 that in chapters and also in chapters 4 and 6 how the rebuilding project of the city walls came under significant opposition. The inkling of opposition that they had, that he had when he set out on the way, starts to reveal itself more and more. To begin with, they throw mocking accusations. These accusations from powerful enemy leaders to the people of Jerusalem, to the people of Israel. This then turns into threats of attack from an alliance of enemy armies, then leads to attempts to entrap Nehemiah, to undermine his leadership, and then an open letter full of lies and false witness statements accusing Nehemiah of wanting power for himself to topple the ruler of the region, the overall ruler of the region. But because of Nehemiah's intimate relationship with God, every single one of these attacks was successfully deflected. How powerful is that? Massively powerful. So Nehemiah had an unshakable faith. He bore witness to God, was completely defiant against those who mocked, denied his opponent's claims to Jerusalem. In fact, well, let's just take a look at that. So that's in 2 verse 20. So in 2 verse 20, just because it's, it's topical. So let's, let's go from 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in, Jeru in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. How relevant is this now to the world that we're living in? But this is 430 years before Jesus Christ. 
We're reading it here right now today in this men's conference. Nehemiah also responded by immediately praying to God at every juncture to come against those who attacked them, deflected every accusation that came against them back up to God, and this enabled the builders to just carry on with the job. His position of leadership was critical. The builders carried on with the job. He didn't take the pain himself. He just deflected it back up to God. He knew that this was possible. He knew that God was stronger. Very importantly, he also set the example of prayer. He prays a lot during the book of these opening chapters of Nehemiah. But in, in, in chapter 4, verse 9, for the first time, it says the others in the city were inspired to join him in communal prayer. They weren't doing it to start off with. It was just him in leadership. But they started joining him in communal prayer together to God. This was powerful. The men of the city together, and I can bet you their families were also praying with them. By this stage, all the men and their families were invested. They were all working hard but they were all at risk of attack as well. And they all responded in faith to God. Nehemiah hears the doubts and the fears of others in Judah. These fears encouraged fresh threats from their enemies, which in turn brought further fear. But Nehemiah strategically responds. I'm just going to read verses 13 of, um, uh, 13 to 20 of, I think it's, Where is that? Yeah, I think 13 to 20, verse 4. Yeah. So chapter 4, sorry, 13 to 20. So therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives and fight for your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. His strategy has a few strands to it. Firstly, it's a military response to the phys- in the physical realm. A military response to position the army to make the defenses appear stronger to the enemy. Wherever the wall was down, he just positioned a ton of soldiers. So that there was no weak point. And it looked like there was a massive army behind them. But once, in, but once this was in place, he, instruct, he instructs everyone not to put their trust in their defenses, but again, in their great and awesome Lord. Then he commands them with that faith and without fear to fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. What a battle cry to the men of the city of Jerusalem. What a leader with the focus defiantly and resolutely on God. They were all equipped. They were all ready for battle, but he was constantly putting it back on the Lord. He ensured everyone's trust must not be on human strategy, but solely on the Lord and says he will battle on our behalf. Our God will fight for us, he says in verse 20. In chapter 4, 15, we read that their enemies freaked out The enemies totally freaked out at all this, and the builders just kept on building. Well, the enemy meant for evil, the Lord turned for good. In chapter 6, again, their enemies try even more methods to entrap and intimidate, but Nehemiah rebuffs them by calling their bluff, standing his ground and refusing to be intimidated. 
One method was this open letter of false accusation. With false witness, they threatened to make public to the king of the region. It included lies that Nehemiah sorted his own power and control for himself as a self-styled king. With God on his side, Nehemiah simply responded, because these are battles of words. They're battles of words, so he just goes back with words, and he doesn't even waste his breath very much. He just says, none of this is happening. You're just making it all up and out of your head. That's all he says, this massive long letter. Nehemiah continued to pray and ask the Lord for his encouragement and strength. He continued to be brave and courageous, spotting sin and sticking to his principles. The Lord knew that his leadership was important to protect for everyone involved in God's project to rebuild Jerusalem's defenses. And so after all of this, the walls that have stood in ruins for 150 years are completely rebuilt within two months. Within two months, less than two months, it says. So that's a whistle-stop tour of Nehemiah. And there's a lot more to Nehemiah. There's a lot of records of all the different men and their families that are rebuilding the walls. We don't need to read those. But there's also moments where Nehemiah is actually challenged by the fact that there's famine in the land and he addresses that and he has a heart for people. And he also lays down all of his kingly, his, 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 re, his leader privileges. So he was a man of honor and he was a man of humility. But as modern Christian men, what can we learn from the book of Nehemiah? Firstly, the character of Nehemiah and his relationship with God. Nehemiah always put God first, no matter what the circumstances were. He came through everything by constantly turning to God, praying to God, aligning with God, acknowledging God, and seeing everything from God's perspective. And God was at work in the details of his life because he was all in. And secondly, we learn the importance of all working together as men within the body of Christ to bring about God's purposes for his kingdom that blesses our families, the wider church, and the communities that we live in. You see, many people today, they feel they need to be the strong man or the hard man. Society teaches us to push back at those that push us. But at the end of the day, when we get in front of God, are we going to be the tough man in front of God? Are we going to be the hard man, the strong man? No, we're not going to be that man. It's the act of coming closer to God, of coming into a place of intimacy with him, is described by some people as being vulnerable before God. Vulnerable. But personally, I don't really rate this description of being vulnerable before God. I don't think it does it justice. I don't think it's accurate. To be vulnerable is to be in danger or in a position of being taken advantage of. And this is just not what we encounter when we draw close to the Father. He's not a threat when we come to him. Instead, he delights in lovingly engaging with us as men. Nehemiah had this intimate relationship with God, and from this relationship, he goes on to have remarkable strength, remarkable strength in the face of those that threaten him. Not just him, but everyone under his authority. He went on to become one of the most resilient leaders that Israel has ever seen in a place when they were at their weakest. This is a resilience that we can all develop as we step towards the Lord. One big problem for men in the church is when we lose track of how God intends us to be as men. Without realizing it, we can prioritize looking to the fallen world for the answers. And this is God's problem as well. It's God's problem as well when we do this. For as long as Christian men take their eyes off Jesus and instead look to ourselves and our coping mechanisms, I've done this as well myself, or we define ourselves by the world and respond in those worldly ways, we can't be fruitful for God. And this actually starts a dangerous chain reaction, particularly when there's a lot of us doing it. If we as Christian men bypass God, if we don't go all in for God, 
He doesn't move in his power. We struggle. We struggle. Those around us struggle. The church struggles. And society struggles. This is the chain reaction. The fallen world looks to the fallen world for answers, but the answers it needs can't be found in the world because it's the place of sin. So as Christian men, we should not look there either. Society without God is not going to fix the issues. And it's not going to fix the issues we have as modern men. It's only God that can fix the issues. It's only God that can fix the issues in society. He has a plan through Jesus. And that plan involves us. Each one of us has a responsibility not to bypass God, but to put God at the top, Jesus at the top in our lives, and to look to him for the answers. Then God can move in his power. Let's bring it back to Jesus every single time. Let's bring it back to intimate relationship with the Father, guided by the Holy Spirit. So God can work through each of us men, through our families, our churches, for the benefit of society and for the benefit of his kingdom. We have a role to play to work with the Lord to rebuild what has been lost. To rebuild what has been lost But we do not do this alone. We work together and with one another. Being all in with God is to surrender. So what about that phrase, surrender to God? We talk about it quite a lot in this church. Surrender to God. We might think about what what we think about surrender, that word surrender. What do we think when we hear that word surrender? Perhaps a white flag flapping on a, over a battlefield. An army admitting defeat. Surrender. Or maybe arms raised above our heads to signal to an enemy, I'm not fighting you anymore, and I'm at your mercy. These are all negative connotations of surrender. And of course they are. Our instinct is to fight and to keep on fighting. That's just built in in us in men. When we as men are in a combat situation, it, that's, that's just the way we are. To fight or flight, depending on the wisest strategic decision, to maintain advantage over an enemy. To fight or flight. But never to surrender. Surely never to surrender. Not unless all is completely lost And there is no other feasible outcome. But God is not our enemy. When we come to surrender to God, he is a father who wants the very best for us. He's the epitome of love. He sent his own son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to suffer that that agonizing and brutal human death just so that we could be reconnected to himself as he originally intended. Surrender is about new opportunities with God. New opportunities with God. Being brought out of any kingdom that we try and make for ourselves, which leads to the defeated kingdom of darkness, and into the Lord's kingdom, the kingdom of God. The idea of submission, of coming under the authority of someone more powerful like a king, is an obsolete concept to the modern Western man. We can quite happily watch a movie like in Lord of the Rings with like a battle scene and there's like the king on horseback rousing all of his troops, all of the thousands of men in armor. It's fine in a movie. Today, our country has a brand new king, King Charles III, but he has no authority. He has no authority compared to old kings of old. The idea of us to be in complete submission to King Charles III is a completely laughable notion. Because we are kings of our own destiny in this modern age, there is an instinct that veers towards rebellion against anyone with power rather than submission to it. But of course, as Christian men, when it comes to God, he's our king. Do we submit to God as our king? Do we fear him? 
Do we revere him? We're to bow the knee to him, to be on our face before him. The truth is that whether we have faith or not, the Bible says the day will come when each one of us will bow the knee before God. As Christian men, we're to get on with this in this life, to get on with this in this life, rather than make excuses not to. We're to lower ourselves and allow Jesus to lift us up. When we serve God, he elevates us. The Bible tells us that because of Jesus, we're in the throne room of the king. We're already there. We have the king's attention, and our attention is to be on the king. We have the king's attention, and our attention is to be on the king. That's where we're already at, because we've given our lives to Jesus. When we're all in for God, we are like Nehemiah. Like I said earlier, we know what it is to serve a king, and the king trusts us explicitly. To be all in for God as a man is to know the Father's love. Central to God is love. God is love. Yet there is a lack amongst us men, even Christian men, of experiencing the true love that comes from the Father. This is a foreign love to our hearts that have been hardened by our lives in the fallen world. God's love is an unconditional and abundant love expressed and demonstrated through Jesus Christ. To many in the world, many men in the world, it's a love they've never experienced, but it's there for them. He's our father and we are his children. When we come as men of faith, we are to grasp the Father's love for us because his love changes us. God's love changes us. It's a love that enables us to trust him completely. It's a love in which we are accepted just as we are. By his grace, his love is abundant and constant no matter what we have done. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's a love that keeps giving the love of the Father. It's a love that opens up a truly healthy relationship with God that's not possible with anyone else. Jesus died to open up a relationship with the Father that we were always meant to have. He did not die so that we could ignore him, but to know him. It's a love that enables us to give things over to Jesus. It's a love that helps us have space to address our concerns, our pains, our hurts, our frustrations, our disappointments, and give them all over to Jesus. He said, give me your burdens. Do we give them over? Jesus died on the cross so that we could do this, and it's so important that we do. It's a love that sets an example. Jesus' death was the ultimate expression of the Father's love, a love so amazing it calls us to respond. We may have been a Christian for decades. We may be brand new to the faith. If there are things we need to grasp and grow in, then it's important that we grasp and grow in them. Take hold of the relationship that Jesus Christ has died for you to have. But it's also important because it's not just about us. It's not just about us. We're not responsible for society and what goes on in the world, but we are responsible for what we can do in the church the equipping of family, fathers alongside mothers, husbands alongside wives. If we hold true to the Bible and work to empower one another as men to be what God is asking us to be, and we come together as a brotherhood and in unity with women of faith in our marriages and, and as parents, then we're more likely to go on and ensure there's a growing of the kingdom of God as God wants it to be, rather than it being broken. And that, in turn, benefits society around us. Men have an active role in the kingdom of God, not just turning up at church and sitting at the back, but having a mindset of having a part to play, being all in for God, being a part of the body of Christ, his church, to fight for our families, as Nehemiah said, to fight for our marriages, to fight for our children. Just like Nehemiah instructed 
We need to get the balance back of men in the church being all in for God. We believe in this church there are ruins that need rebuilding. God's church is dormant and silent on many things it should be upholding today. God's brought a number of people into the church this year who have heard the gospel and given their, li- given their lives to Jesus. But what are they saying? They're saying, why has nobody ever told me about Jesus before? The message is not getting out. This country has a legacy of Christian faith, but the Lord's church has grown more and more invisible. It's not operating in the power of God. There are things to be done. There's a situation to redress. There is territory to reclaim that has been lost. There are fortifications to be rebuilt. Persevering in spite of the accusations, each man building their section of wall, each man all in for God and taking their stand with the Lord, each church fixing their eyes on Jesus and working with him, each part doing their bit so the Lord's will is done and his intricate plans are achieved. We are men in Jesus Christ, and we're an important part of his church. We've got to be all in together. Thank you.